man, if there's a being up in heaven right now who spoke the world into existence and made me, if there's literally a person right now, a being who determines whether or not I live for the next 30 seconds, think about that. Someone else is in control. He determines whether I continue breathing. Then the thought of the authority that he holds over my thoughts, my feelings, my... To me, it was just logic. Like, if there's a being like that, who cares what I feel? Who cares what I think? I, I need to be right in his eyes. And so the authority of God's word and his commands, I've just, for some reason, my logic tells me I should take that person's words very seriously. And if there really is a creator, then why do I value my own opinion so much? I know that authority is almost like a bad word in today's society because everyone wants to be in control and just kind of you do you. But my logic leads me to believe if he is there, I want to be right in his eyes. I, I was definitely different from the average teenager in a lot of ways, but I think the biggest thing was because my parents were dead, you know, my mom died uh, giving birth to me and my dad remarried, but then my stepmother died in a car accident when I was eight and my dad got married again, then he died of cancer when I was 12. So by the time I'm entering into my teen years, I've had three parents die. And it's a, it's a, I don't care, I'm not gonna try to act all tough or whatever. When I saw their dead bodies and, and we buried them, it freaked me out, the finality of it you just realize I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. And so as a teenager, I'm just thinking, I need to know the truth, okay? I saw my parents die. I watched as their bodies went into the ground. I had nightmares about it. Like, what happens? What happens when I go into the ground? Like, like man, it just ended. They were here yesterday and now it's over. Like. I, I would look at life that way and I, I would look at my school and everyone's into their different thing and, and I'd go, gosh, don't you see that it could end tomorrow and don't you want some answers? And so I was on this search, like I need to know what happens if I die today and I want to be sure of that. And then I can move on and, and go and play and do whatever else, but these were real things in my life and so when I began to pursue this idea, is there something more than just what I see here? It definitely put me on a different journey. There was a different urgency in me. You know, I'm 52 now. I didn't think I'd live to 52. My parents certainly didn't live even close to this. Uh, it was just a different mindset of life can end tomorrow or today and if I find the truth, then I need to follow that truth wherever it leads me, uh, no matter how painful it is or whatever else, because I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. So I, I, I've spoken about how my dad died when I was 12, but I, I don't often talk about how there was a part of me that was glad, I, I hate to say it, but because we didn't have a good relationship. We didn't have, I don't know, even what I would call a relationship. It was just more of a, he was just an enforcer, one to punish me. I feel pretty severely for like little things that I would do wrong. And so when he died, there was a part of me that was relieved. Like, whoa, I'm not under that anymore. And so when I started believing in God and reading about how he was a good father. It's hard to just, you hear that word father, and I wanna believe God's word, but there's just a lot of baggage there. 
And so all the passages about fearing him, I had no problem with that. I can fear. I know how to fear a father. But then when there's verses about his love and pursuit of him, of us, uh, his forgiveness of us, his unconditional love for us, his desire for us, growing up and just feeling like he never, re- my dad didn't really want me around was kind of, you know, because I'm the one that, in a sense, killed his wife. You know, his, his wife died while she was giving birth to me. If, if I didn't happen, he'd still have his wife. And so it just felt like there's this underlying tension of, I wish you were never there. Now I'm reading about a, a loving father who desires me and, you know, and sings over me. And I, I'm just like, this is so, it's, it's weird. Okay, so there's this truth that there are passages of scripture that almost feel negative, like commands, thou shall not. And it's like, I don't like that, but I'm going to submit to it. But then there are these truths about his promises and his goodness that I naturally go, I have a hard time believing that. So, So surrendering to God is, okay, I'm going to believe these truths about you that I don't like, but I'm also gonna believe these truths about you that seem too good to be true. Both of them in the flesh, I war again. It's hard to have faith in some of his promises. And I noticed years ago, it's like I'm okay at trembling at his commands, you know, but I don't tremble at his promises. Like I didn't have the same reverence for his promises and the things about him that seemed almost too good to be true. I was like, God, give me faith to believe in that, that you adore me right now, that you're thinking about me right now, that you love me, you're singing over me, you desire me. Why in the world would you want Francis Chan after all the garbage that I've done, all the ways that I've offended you, all the ways I fail you every week, how could you want me right now? Man, because I didn't have an earthly dad that, that, that will come over here for his, I never had that. And so I'm reading these promises, and it's just hard to believe. But again, trusting him means, oh God, give me faith to believe in your forgiveness, your desire for me. Oh God. Just like I need your spirit to believe and follow these commands I don't want to follow. God, I need your help to believe these promises that I just find so unbelievable. One of the things Jesus said to the crowds was, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. Those are very unpopular words today when uh, everyone wants to just do what they want to do. We all want to do what we want to do. And yet Jesus says, no, if you want to follow me, I mean, the idea of following someone, like we, we, don't, we don't get this concept of following, like you are the king, and so I choose to come under your command. You say go left, I'm like, but I really want to go right. It doesn't matter, you're my king. Jesus asked the question, I think it's Luke 6, 46, where he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I command? He said, it doesn't make sense that you would call someone your master, your Lord, and then you don't do what they command you to do. It's, It's like, you know, if a master tells his servant, hey, go go wash my car, he's like, no, master. That, like, that, that, that makes no sense. You don't, then don't call him master. That's what Jesus was saying. And, and people don't understand, when you call Jesus your Lord, your king, that means he calls you to do things that you're not going to want to do. That, that, that's why he says you're going to have to deny yourself. So as I started studying this book, there were commands, you know, as a high school student, you know, want to mess around with girls or whatever. And, and you know, you read the scriptures like, ah, oh, that's, that's 
that's reserved for marriage? Uh, you know, just, just whatever the natural desire is, it, there were certain things where you go, ah, oh, I have to say no to that. Just even reading from the very beginning, the, the sin of Eve going, oh, I want to eat of the fruit, but God said no. I'm going to do it anyways. It, you know, it was just this, this separation. And so I, I think we, well, there's this very fundamental, uh, again, it's my logic, obvious truth. If I'm going to call someone master, that means there are times when I will do what he tells me to do when I don't feel like it. And I don't know how that's been lost, but it has been lost. And so... There are things in scripture that I certainly wouldn't have come up with uh, that Francis Chan doesn't like, but you know what? That's part of the choice I made in saying, I believe in you, Jesus. I'll follow you, Jesus. After everything you've done for me, I trust you. And trust means I trust you when your logic doesn't square with mine. I trust that actually what Isaiah 55 says is that your thoughts are so far beyond mine. And that's, you know, humility is not something we see nowadays. Everyone just trusts so much in what they feel and what they believe. And following God means, you know, I actually trust that your logic is better than mine. And so when we disagree, I'm going to assume that I'm wrong. And we just don't hear that type of thinking nowadays. One of the hardest things to do as a Christian is uh, it's, it's not just denying yourself, your own desires, but it's when you love someone. You really love a person and you see that the way they're living contradicts what God says. And what I wrestle with, I still wrestle with it, is I love being loved. I love when someone loves me back, right? And being accepted. And, and so there are times when I want someone's approval, I want their friendship. And yet for me to love them means I have to tell them what this book says because I want them to be right with God. They're going to stand before God one day. And, and there are times that God tells me, you know, an open rebuke, you know, the Bible says is better than a hidden love. And to truly love someone is to, to tell them, look, you're going to stand before this God and here's what he says. And there, there's times when God, God tells the people, look, I didn't come to bring peace. He says, I came to bring a sword and I'm going to divide you know, father from mother, from kid to, you know, wife. Like, Jesus says, you're, you're going to have to make a choice. There are times when my love, you, you know, my love for you and your love relationship with me is going to interfere with this love you have for other people. And at, that, th at those times, you're going to have to take a stand and are you going to be ashamed of my words because you want this relationship with this person so badly? Or are you going to follow me? Jesus says, unless you hate your father, mother, wife, kids, you can't be my disciple. His point is your love relationship with me has to be number one. There can't even be a close number two. Like your love for them has to look like hatred. And so there are times when I've had to say things to people based upon the word of God, and it's so painful because I love these people so much, and I know they're going to hate me. I know they're going to reject me. I, I, I mean, but that's, that's, that was Jesus' life. Like, he was willing to preach truth, even if it meant rejection, his crucifixion. That, that's, that's a life of every prophet, basically, in the Old Testament. It's like... I'm going to preach truth even though I know you're going to kill me, but this is the most loving thing I can say to you, and my commitment to God is first. And so there have been times when I've had to address friends on divorcing their wives and going, oh, 
dude, you can't go through with this. You don't have biblical grounds. And I look at passages like Matthew 18 or uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 5, where he says, you know, if anyone calls himself a brother but continues in these sins without repentance, don't even associate with them. It's like, oh, God, this is one of my best friends, but he's leaving his wife for this other girl. And, you know, I, I've looked friends in the eye and go, look, if you can't keep calling yourself a Christian and move in this direction. And if you do, like, biblically, I can't even associate with you. And I love you. Man, you know I love you. You know how many years we've been friends. And I'd do anything for you but my commitment to God. And, and I've had friends like, like this close to my face going, you're telling me. I'm like, yes. Like that's how seriously I take God's words and this commitment to him. And it's tough. Those have been some of the toughest times in my Christian walk in following him. The first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I remember hearing it in the context of a, some sort of kids gathering or youth gathering, and everyone just kind of nods their head. And I don't know, for me, I'm just like, that's a big deal. And every year of my life, it's become a bigger and bigger deal. The thought that in the beginning. So there was a time when Francis Chan didn't exist. Yeah, you know, it was only, you know, 50 something years ago. If it's true that there's a being who spoke and this whole world that we're sitting on right now came into existence. It's like, that's a giant gap between that being and me and my little brother. Even right now, I'm sick. You know, you can probably hear it in my, 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 my voice. And, and it's like, gosh, my fragile little tiny human, you know, one breath left in these lungs compared to a creator who whenever that beginning was, there wasn't even an earth. He just speaks it into existence. That gap means everything. Like, who am I compared to that? See, we, a lot of us, we sit around and look in the mirror and go, who am I? And, you know, we try to figure it out and we compare ourselves to other people. And you just start with Genesis 1-1 and ask yourself the question, who am I? That, that verse, in the beginning, God created. Oh God, what if you never thought to create this earth? You never thought to create me. I was just a thought in your mind of this much bigger picture and plan. And, and that's, that's, that's the starting point in us before we look in the mirror and go, who am I? Look at Genesis 1-1 and ask yourself, okay, what is your identity? What's so crazy about that whole Genesis creation passage is when he talks about creating man, it's different from all, you know, from creating the, the earth itself and the water and even the animals. It says, no, we're going to make man in our image. And this is different from the animals, the plants, the earth itself, because man is going to be created in the image of God. So when we talk about identity, it's like, okay, I'm not just this worthless piece of dust also. There's something so special to me that I was made in the image of God. And even there's just, there's just weirdness of, you know, let us, you know, make man in our image. And it's like, what's he talking about? And, and 
from our further reading of scripture, there's this unity with the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we don't understand. And it, it, it's like this, it's like in his very being, he's, he's like three, but he's one. And there's this, this connection. It's like he was made, he, he, or we were made in his image. And just like God is this singular yet plural, like this confusing relationship, he invites us into that relationship and that unity. And it's like, wait, what is, wait a second. There's this, there's this, I'm made to have relationship with you. Like in, in my very essence, somehow I was made to be one with God. That, and I, I know I'm not explaining it well because it's like, it's, it's kind of beyond our understanding in some ways. It's like he makes it so that there are things that we don't quite understand about him. The Bible says we see in part, we see in like a mirror dimly, but he does reveal some things to us. And I believe that passage is very important that I was created in his image so that I was made to have fellowship with him. That's, that's why I like the psalmist in Psalm 8, he says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? He's like, I look at the stars. I look at the way everything works. And any of us that have studied our, our Milky Way or the solar system, we're like, what the heck? This thing goes on forever. We're the tiniest little speck. And, the, and then you look in a microscope and you're like, what in the world? What is going on in my mouth with every saliva gland? You're like, this is intense. The God who created all of this says he made me in his image and I was made to have fellowship with him, like to be one with him. And then you start reading the New Testament and going, wait, that creator sacrificed, suffered because he wanted to forgive me and have this union so badly? Why do I care about anything else? Why do I? Okay, so yes, I love people and I love my relationship with them, but you're telling me I could be one and I was made in his image and there's something in the core of my essence that was created specifically different from all other creation because he wanted oneness with me. And these are the words Jesus says, look, I'm knocking at the door. If anyone opens that door, I'll come into him and I'll dine with him. As my father and I will be one with him. My very spirit will enter into him. It's this oneness that we were made for that is possible that makes all the things of the world that the material possessions and health and everything else just feel so trivial compared to that. I think the most popular lie today is, is, is really the same lie from the beginning. It's just, you can do what you wanna do. You're a good person. It's that whole idea of independence. It's, it's, it's what, it, it just, it's almost like the same lie that just gets packaged differently. You know, Eve saw something that was attractive and Satan lies to her and says, come on, did God really say that's wrong? And you see it, you like it. Just say, God's just trying to keep you uh, to suppress you uh, and keep you from doing what you want to do. Just take of it. Just take of it. Come on, Eve. You know, he, he's just, he's afraid that if, when you take of this, then suddenly you're going to become like him. You get to decide what's good and evil. Come on, you're, you're just like him. It's, it's, it's this, 
It's the self-righteousness of, I don't need to come under someone else's commands. I have a goodness in me that I can just do whatever I feel like doing because whatever I do is good. I, I mean, the vast majority of the world uh, believes that, no, I'm a good person because we've been taught that and, and we compare ourselves to other people and, and that we all have this right to, to really be our own judge. It's, it's quite different from what Paul says, where he says, look, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. So Paul's saying, I don't care if you judge me or any human court judges me. I, don't, I can't even judge myself right. He says, I, I, my conscience can be clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. And we just live in a time when, uh, and again, it's packaged differently in the book of Judges. It says everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's no different today. Everyone just goes, well, here's what I think. Here's what I think. Here's what I think. Here's what I feel. And we feel pretty good about ourselves. And we go, well, I'm not like Hitler. You know, everyone says that same thing, or I'm not like this guy. Or I'm not like, well, I'm not like those people in the church and those conservative Republicans. Or I'm not like these, you know, it's just like we, we, we kind of make our own uh, system of right and wrong. And for some reason, we've, everyone feels right doing that rather than looking at the scriptures, saying, God, I, I don't trust myself. I've been wrong before. I've done what I thought was morally right, and it, would, it really hurt some people. Some things I used to think were right, I now think are wrong. So how, what kind of judge am I? I think it's just this whole idea of I can judge myself or let the go with what's popular. And uh, right now it's very popular it's to, to just, as long as you're not hurting anyone, you're okay. One of the biggest struggles today, and I believe it's the enemy setting it up this way, we hear so many voices on a given day. Uh, you just look at your phone and it's just message all of these voices. I, I mean, we have access to so many, and, and the majority will say the same thing. They'll push you the same way. And Jesus made this clear. He says, look, there's a wide, wide road that's easy and leads to destruction. And many will go down this wide, easy road. And then there's this narrow, difficult road that leads to life and few will find it. That's why there would be times when there were thousands of people following Jesus. He would speak and those thousands would just walk away from him. And he's left with a, a dozen people there and going, you guys want to leave too? And for, for, for Peter saying, no, you've got the words of life. Uh, where would we go? Well, I'm not leaving you. You've got the keys to So you got this little group that walked away from the thousands. And that's a difficult thing today. It's no different. Now you've got millions of voices all screaming the same thing. Hey, whatever you feel like doing, you do you. Don't let anyone tell you this. You, oh, you're going to trust a book that's thousands of years old? You, you know, it's, it's just, it's laughable by these Millions of voices. The wide, easy road is just to go with, man, is what everyone's saying now. Who thinks like that anymore? Who still takes the authority of God's word? You know, like, man, people don't understand. Like, it's always been like this. We have to learn to be quiet and drown out these other voices. And I feel so bad for this younger generation because at least I can remember what it was like when there were no cell phones and 
you, you know, you just weren't always constantly connected to all these people and you didn't have these shallow, you know, Instagram relationships and followers and thumbs up and, you, you know, and it was just, you could be quiet and Your mind wasn't racing and there wasn't just pressure. It just wasn't as great as it is today. So in some ways it's the same as it's always been, but in other ways it's different. Young people have such a pressure and that wide road and easy road just seems, it feels a bit wider and easier. And the narrow road just seems a little steeper and more difficult and fewer, fewer people who are truly hearing the voice of God and even want to hear the voice of God. Because what Paul warns Timothy is, he goes, in the last days, you know what people are going to do? They're going to look for people and teachers to tell them what they want to hear. And, and they're going to find those teachers that tell them what they want because there are things that I naturally want. And I can, it's easy to find a teacher to tell you what you want. And you gotta ask yourself, am I, just, am I just trying to find someone to tell me what I want, what I want to hear, or do I really want truth, even if that truth leads me away from my own desires, even if that lead, leads me to saying, I can't sleep with my girlfriend anymore. I can't sleep with my boyfriend anymore. I want God that badly that I'll leave all earthly relationships. And that's the hardest thing. It's these greatest desires, probably our greatest desire. You know, I was once told when I was in high school, like your two strongest emotions will be, I don't know if it was emotions or whatever, feelings, sex and anger. You know, it's just this desire, you know, that you, it's just like this, urge like you just want to explode and just say something or just crack someone in the face it's just this it's this explosive side with you or that sexual urge it's like these are so strong there's just these fires and to put that under submission and go okay i'll love my enemies i'll do good to those who hate me, I'll bless those who curse me. <sighs> or I'll suppress this urge that I have for this person right now because God, you are my Lord. Those are the times when you find out, is he really master? So I've been married for 26 years. I've got seven kids, grandkid, another grandkid on the way. And the thing I, I love my wife. I, I adore her. She's amazing. Um, but uh, I, I see marriage in its rightful place. I think sometimes even in the church, they, they make everything about, oh, if you can have a good wife and, you know, family. And it's like, that's not really the way the Bible talks about marriage. I mean, yes, it's a beautiful thing created by God, but it's very small uh, in Scripture in comparison to your relationship with God. I, I, I mean... It's it, Jesus. If, if you write down everything Jesus says about family, I think you'd be shocked. It's it's just like you've got to you've got to be willing to hate your wife and kids compared to this relationship with God. I, I mean, marriage was only supposed to be a, a a a picture of something so much greater, which is my union with God. You, you know, great. I I have this union with my wife. You know. I enjoy sex like everyone else, but seriously, it's like compared to a union with the creator who spoke the world into existence, my oneness with him. I mean, as great as Lisa and the kids are, they are such a far second. I really mean that compared to God. 
I, I, it's, it's, and I don't think people get that. I rarely see people get that. They, they treat like marriage is everything. And it's like, no, that my marriage to God is truly everything. The thought that, are you kidding? In heaven, there's this being who the Bible says dwells in unapproachable light. That the high angels are like, like covering themselves up with their wings, screaming out his holiness because he's so far beyond us. He's the creator. And he says, you can be one with me. And when I think about that, and, and he says that he will love me and cherish me as a member of his body, like you would love your own arm. And I'm going, God thinks of me like that? Gosh, this is insane. He loves me that much. I'm one with him. Like, that needs to be just head and shoulders so far beyond my union with my wife, which is great, which I would put it up against any marriage. And my love for my kids, their love for me, I'd put that up against anyone's family. I mean, we love each other, but... God is on another level, and my union with him is on another level. And even our union as husband and wife, we see in light of our union with him, and we're together to do his work. And we don't make decisions based on, oh, what will make our family happiest? We go, God, what do you, you gave us this family. What do you want us to do with it? Where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do? Uh, what decisions do you want us to make as a family? Because it's about you being Lord of our lives. Something I'd like to say to all the, the youth, consider humility. Just consider it for a second. Just consider the thought that maybe there's someone who knows so much more than you. And that your feelings and your thoughts might be off. When I surrendered just my own pride, just thinking I knew best, it feels like this loss, like I'm letting go of who I am or whatever. And it's like, no, Jesus says, if you lose your life, that's when you'll find it. But you try to save it and that's when you'll lose it. He says, you, you surrender to me and you're going to find real life. But if you try to hold on, you're going to lose it. It's somewhat counterintuitive, but that's, that's what it means to trust someone. And God says, he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You're never going to experience the grace of God if you hold on to this belief that you're the center of the universe and you're good and you can figure it all out. God says he'll oppose you. And I have found, and again, I, I get it. This is one person's opinion. And like the Bible says, it's this narrow road and few. Of, I know the vast majority of people on this earth will reject what I say. I get it. I get it. But I'm going to say it anyways. When I humbled myself, and every time I humble myself and follow God instead of my own mind, in my own desires, I've experienced the grace of God. I've experienced blessing. Even last year, at my 25 year anniversary, my wife goes, do you know anyone more blessed than we are? Like, can you think of anyone happier than us on the earth? She goes, I know there has to be someone like that, but I can't, I mean, it's great hearing that from you. She just goes, I just think we're the happiest people in the world. And I'm sitting there going, I think so too. And, and, and then, and that was last year. I go, this year was on another level. Like if we were happy last year, I'm just saying like that surrender that, that seems like you're letting go of something because you just think you know best that's going to kill you. 
And it's when you humble yourself that you experience this grace that I'm telling you is just unbelievable. And I just beg you, humble yourself before God because that's when you experience his grace. There's a story in the Bible when uh, Jesus asked Peter, hey, who do people say that I am? And he's like, oh, some say this, some say that. And he goes, okay, who do you say that I am? And that's such, a, such an important question because the world right now, everyone's saying, oh, Jesus is a good teacher. I like this, you know, yeah, Jesus is a good prophet. But it comes down to who do you say that he is? And that, that, may, that may be, in my mind, I think it is the most important question on the earth. What would I say, who is Jesus to me? He's the creator. He's my judge. Because scripture says so. It says that all things were created by him and for him. Jesus is also the judge. He says that at the end, he says the father doesn't judge anyone. He's given all judgment to the son. I go, he's my creator. I was made by him, for him. He's going to judge me at the end of the earth, at the end of my life. And he's my savior. The Bible says that he made him who knew no sin become sin on my behalf, that I might become the righteousness of God through him. The Bible says that I was at enmity with God because of my offenses and everything. But what Christ did on that cross was he took the wrath of God for me. So he's my savior. I, I, there's no short answer to this. It's, it's, it's like, without him, I would have to face God one day, having done some pretty bad things in my life, and having to answer for that. And Jesus took that for me. No one's ever loved me like that. I'd be scared of death. I'd be confused about life. I'd feel hopeless. As a dad, I'm blown away by my kids that are grown. I just walked my second daughter up the aisle a little over a month ago, crying the entire way up there. And, uh, oh man, and I love the guy that she married. I, my two son-in-laws are like two of my closest friends, two of the godliest men that I know. I, I'm not exaggerating, two of the godliest men that I know. I'm going, God, what? What in the world? That father-daughter dance, you know, that they do at the wedding, I'm just sobbing as I'm holding my daughter because I'm just thinking about all the great memories. Like, I just can't imagine a better relationship. There may be one on the earth. Like, there may be a father-daughter relationship, better, but it's just like, ah. Oh. And so to give her away, it was like the one of the best days and one of the worst days. Like, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. But one thing I can say is uh, I'm not worried about her as I give her away to this man because she walks with Jesus. Like, her walk with the Lord is on another level than mine was at that age. It's, it's just not even comparable. It really isn't. The things that come out of her mouth, the wisdom, the, the depth, the love, the connection. I'm just like, what in the world? I, I wasn't anything close to that. My son-in-laws, the wisdom that I hear coming out of their mouths. This is what you want for the next generation, right? You're just like, they're starting here. 
They're starting here. And I think too many parents are just content with, oh, I hope my kids hold on to the faith and, you know, hold on to some of my faith. That was never my desire. I'm going, God, please, I've got this connection with you that I love, but that's not enough for them. They need to, you know, like, like that saying goes, they need to jump off of my shoulders and take it to another level. First of all, it's absolutely the grace of God. Do not think for a second that I'm trying to tell parents, hey, do it the way I did it because, you know, that'll work. The moment you go down that road, uh, that's just arrogance. Okay, grace of God, grace of God, grace of God. Thank you, Lord, that my kids are walking with you, that they love you, that... I'm just seeing even my younger ones, just like the spirit of God. I still got a five-year-old at home. And when he prays, I'm like, whoa, what in the world? Okay, so I, I know I'm an anomaly with you know, married kids and a, and a five-year-old at home. But I just go, God, your grace on all their lives. That's why they're walking with you. And there was a time, even in my oldest one, she was just like, Lord, what's going on? Please, please, please change your heart. And he did. And she fell in love with Jesus. So I know it's not me. It's this miracle. But if there's one thing that uh, Lisa and I did right, or maybe by the grace of God had right thinking upon, was we try to teach them the right thing, but we, we, we really believe that old adage that 90-something percent of what your kids learn will be caught and not taught that it doesn't matter what we say, they'll remember us and our example. And if we're not the real thing, we can't hide it with good teaching. Let's just try to follow the Holy Spirit wherever he leads us. And let's show them a life of faith and they'll see that God rewards those who earnestly seek him by just looking at our lives. And so I am grateful for that. And so even with teaching and showing them videos and everything else and right teaching, nothing, uh, nothing replaces you as a parent in your walk with the Lord. Because think about it. We figured out our parents at some point. And we're like, eh, he said this, but... I knew his life. Or you go, yeah, my parents didn't say much, but I saw their lives and I saw the power. I saw what happened when they prayed. I saw the answers to prayer. I saw the steps of faith that they took and I saw the way God came through. That's what we wanted to reveal to our kids was not, hey, look at us, look at us, look at us, but watch God. Watch God, when we take these steps of faith, I wanted them to see God so they didn't grow up going, oh, we had good parents. It's like, no, my parents followed God and we saw God come through for them and God rewarded them in ways that didn't make sense. And my parents had a peace they didn't stress out about things. And they just always knew God was going to come through. And he always did. And I want to live that way. And there were times, I remember one time, pulling my kids aside, I go, look, there he goes again. There's God. And I'm telling you, you could just marry whoever. But I would tell you, you'll miss out on some of this stuff if you don't marry someone that seriously wants to live by faith. And maybe that's part of why they married guys that live by faith, is they saw it in mom and dad and said, okay, I want, I want that same thing. So I'm not saying don't teach the word of God, obviously teach it in the home, but you gotta watch your life closely. And uh, you're not as good of a liar as maybe you think you are. Those who live with you will see the real you. So. Don't live as a liar. Know your God deeply. Love him with all your heart that you maybe will 